Okay, so Jay Ryder and Liberating Truth, Jason and Maurice, this is part two of Culture as Software. Um, so I left off, I left off with the Europeans having, um, I shouldn't have said superior weapons, actually, more powerful weapons is the way to say it. You know, this culture is so infused and permeated with ideas of superiority and inferiority that, you know, I can't even get away from, from the, 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 the concept sneak in, you know, even when talking about something that is really just a measure of force. So they had more powerful weapons, the Europeans, and then they imposed their will um, on everybody. And weapons, uh, you can think of that as a cultural aspect, I, I suppose. But in any event, um, no culture is superior to another culture. Now, of course, the problem with this is, you know, viewing culture as the solution to various problems or the solution to a predicament, it has benefits, it has weakness too, which, as you can see, it's a form of relativism, and um, that's really not profoundly satisfying to, to most people. Um, for some reason, we long for some sense of, abs of the absolute. Um, uh, the universe, everything we observe, is constantly in change, and so we long for the absolute. Why do we long for the absolute? Um, I, I don't know why. You know, I mean, here we could insert uh, theistic arguments that, you know, since the whole universe has changed, the absolute must be God, and, and uh, it, it's a form of a longing for God, you know, that we have a need for, we're drawn to. God as the absolute, but it, it's a theistic argument. Um, one could leap in other directions, but I thought it was interesting. By the way, I'm going to digress a bit again for uh, to, to, to share an idea with you, Maurice. Um, I read this great book by Wittgenstein called Remarks on Color, and the whole thing it's a very short book, but it, it's all his attempting to solve one problem. And the problem that he, he, he poses is, why can I not visualize, in my imagination, why, why can I, I not visualize a transparent white? I can visualize a transparent blue, like a, a blue glass, and I can see through it. I can visualize a transparent green, and I can see clearly through it. But when it comes to the color white, um, I can't, me neither. I tried. I can't visualize a purely transparent white. So his whole book asks this question. Now, until I read that book, I thought I, I usually associated the imagination with the visual imagination, and I've thought that you know we could imagine anything. And now I realize that because of that book, that there are limitations to our visual imagination. It's almost limited by nature. We can assemble things that are given to us by the universe. For instance, I can imagine a unicorn, which does not exist, um, hypothetically, uh, by taking a horse and taking a horn from another animal and assembling them. Um, you know, I can even, to some extent, imagine things that don't quite go together. I can, I can, I can do things like that. But some things are impossible for me to imagine because I believe it's a limitation on nature. Now, curiously, and here's a part I think you'll be interested in, Maurice, um, the concept, the words, transparent white, I grasp conceptually, um, even though I can't visually imagine it. So, I mean, I think it indicates that our linguistic imagination, our oral verbal imagination, is much more powerful than our visual imagination. Um, of course, the difficulty with words is when we start assembling words, um, there's a chance that we'll end up with something that is meaningless, that we'll end up with mere babble. Um, so we're constantly struggling with our words to figure out what's true, what's false, what matches reality, what has meaning, what's nonsense, um, uh, you know, etc. So, uh, so I thought that'd be interesting uh, because of the phrase. Uh, uh, in the beginning was the word. Yeah, and then of course the next leap is the word made flesh, which is kind of a, a different thing. But apparently, before the visual imagination, there's the linguistic imagination. Maybe that's what it means. Um, I don't think we'll be able to unify um, based on um, based on different mythi. I just don't think we could do it. I think we have to define ourselves by our predicament and our 
common predicament and then viewing it as a predicament and viewing um, viewing uh, us as a culture faced with that predicament we can come up with practical solutions um, why do we cling to the solutions once we no longer need them you know why do we find we seem to find something that works and then we freeze it and say okay this is the way it's going to be eternally and I think that's because we have this longing for the absolute we want to make something absolute but if conditions change and we're faced with a new predicament our old solutions may fall and fail but in the meantime we've tied our identities into this and we say no we are this we are for instance um, monogamous uh, we are um, this we are that and we tie it into our identity and that actually holds us back from finding relevant new solutions um, etc why do we seem to need an origin I mean we seem to be the only uh, animal that has origin myths and myth myth I um, I mean animals don't need them I mean my cats are not there talking about you know where did cats come from and what's the not just where did they come from but what's the purpose of the cat and where did they what continent were the cats born on and what's the difference between cats and were certain cats created first or certain cats appeared other cat no it's it's us you know and I um, perhaps it's tied in with um, our language I, mean, I know birds have language I mean animals communicate and there are certain types of languages but ours just get us into all kinds of problems I don't know you know maybe it's just our nature as uh, you know being so close to the primates and all um, but anyway, I, I think that, you know, when we, the best, most effective way is to unify on predicament, because if we try to unify on origin theories and origin uh, mythos, it's going to result in just conflict. Some of those, some of them are not, not even internally consistent with themselves, but certainly with each other. It's, gonna, it's difficult to harmonize, and people are going to always disagree, and it's just not fruitful. It's not going to solve any problems, because we stop looking at, the situation we're faced with as a predicament and we start looking at uh, eternal absolutes you know um, and the next thing you know we lose total track of our existential dilemma um, and what needs to be done like putting food on the plate getting jobs for people um, assuring that there's justice etc um, what else do I have um, so Mm, so I, I think uh, um, it's not meaningful, it's not fruitful certainly, and it's not really meaningful to ask whether a culture or a mythos, uh, a myth theory, a mythos, is better than another one. It, it's more meaningful to ask what problem or what predicament does this aspect of this culture solve? or did it solve in the past. That's, I think, a more meaningful way to analyze uh, a mythos, you know, uh, or an origin theory. But that's not going to help with the current problem, the current predicament, and the future predicaments um, have to be handled like any other problem, I mean, pragmatically, you know, with pragmatic steps, you know, a goal from, you know, how do we do this? Let's get from here to there. Um, and, uh, and we run a risk in, in just assuming different mythos and accepting them as true without a critical analysis, we, we run into the problem of possible error, absurdity. I mean, it, they're all stories and they're all made with words. And as I mentioned, you know, words can lead us really into error and absurdity and, and uh, nonsense. But I think this is where individualism helps um, because individualism allows us to analyze what element I may want to accept into my identity or into my belief system as well as the one I inherited or was programmed with by my parents and society how to analyze those individually detect the false ones and remove them which then of course gets a little shaky for us because if our identity is founded on that or parts of our if we have a feeling that our identity is going to collapse that our meaning is going to collapse and a lot of times uh, we draw meaning from our, our mythi then we go into dread. We go into a spiral. We 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 uh, you know we can we can decompensate. Uh, so it's always risky, and this is why uh, things get so heated in the dialogue between different uh, belief systems and mythi systems and religions. You know because people 
feel threatened in where they find their meaning and everybody is passionate about their meaning. The most absolute, cold-minded, rational, logical, positive atheist is, I'm sure, I don't know, but I'm sure, um, very passionate about what is true and what is false and what is reason and what is fact and how to obtain fact and if that were to crumble away there you go that's why people defend reason etc cetera, etc cetera. just like people defend religion it's all mythi um, so we're in search of the absolute unfortunately we're trying to embody it which uh, I don't think uh, we will be good at because we're not absolute and uh, we're not eternal <laughs>